Welcome to the MIM podcast. I'm Adam Norman, founder and CEO at MIM, where we're on a mission to create the best major instant managers in the world. At MIM, our clients range from the largest, most well-known companies through to new, innovative companies across almost every industry from more than 72 different countries. You're going to hear about the best practices, strategies and tactics, how companies deliver major instant management excellence, some of the challenges they face, and different views on major instant management from around the world, as well as how major instant management is constantly evolving. On this podcast, we go deeper, interviewing professionals from the community. Our hope is that you will leave this podcast with some new ideas and a greater passion for major instant performance. In this episode, I got to sit and talk with Jason Woosnam. Jason served in the military for 22 years in the Royal Signals. He's done tours in Bosnia, Iraq and Afghanistan and specialised in communications and infrastructure. On leaving the military, Jason worked for FDM as a major instant manager and then moved to National Grid doing the same role. He currently serves at JP Morgan Chase as an operational major instant manager and we discussed Jason's transition from the military into the corporate world and the skills that he had learned within the army and how those applied to his success. In particular, the pressure that comes with working in the financial sector. Hi Jason, how are you doing? Fine Adam, how are you? Very well, thank you. Very well. So thanks ever so much for coming on the podcast. Um, really excited to talk to you. Um, you and I started speaking, I want to say it was early last year, wasn't it, in 2019 when you were at National Grid? Yeah. Um, and yeah, had a couple of interesting conversations. And so yeah, very excited to have you on. Um, it'd be really good if you could give us a bit of background on yourself for, for people who don't know you. Yeah, so um, I'll take you back to my uh, early career. I joined the uh, Royal Signals. Uh, I joined the Army in uh, 1991. Um, I served 22 years with the Royal Signals in the communi- communication and information services uh, system space. Uh, carried out various roles on operational tours to Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, along with instructional roles, uh, weapons and tactics instructor and recruit training. Uh, then I carried on that theme throughout my my career, instructional around uh, operational um, sort of leanings, but also, uh, you know, technical, some technical tours on operations. Um, I worked in the, uh, I did a, a tour of, uh, Iraq in the Afghan uh, Mission Network Operations Center for NATO. That was a very interesting tour, looking after the communication information systems across the entire region uh, of Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, you know, dealing with outages, dealing with change, dealing with all aspects of ITIL, uh, which sort of got me into it, into the um, the. IT space, so to speak, because it was more communications before, but, uh, you know, the IT space came later. Um, so, yeah, so I did that. Um, and then I left the army in uh, 2013, uh, not really having an understanding of, of of what to go into, because clearly, you know, 22 years doing different jobs, uh, but, but not really. So I think that the phrase is... Um, Jack of all trades, master of none, I think springs to mind with most, uh, you know, communicators in the signals and then in the army, et cetera. Uh, so you learn a bit about everything. So I left in 2013. I joined a, uh, an IT consultant firm called FDM that um, provided me, uh, you know, the, the business acumen, the commercial acumen that you don't get in the army because in the army you get told to do it you have all the resources for that project anyway. Uh, you know, monetary-wise, you have to still organise it, but you have all of the money, money is already agreed by the time you hit, you, you get there. Uh, so they gave us that business acumen. So FDM provided me a soft landing. I then got uh, seconded out to National Grid, 
where I, uh, I eventually led the network infrastructure space for uh, the UK. Um, and then after a couple of years of doing the service delivery manager piece, I then saw a job in the uh, going in for the uh, major incident management uh, piece. So as I'd done quite a bit of major incident management anyway and on operations, I thought it might be best fit. So I then applied for the role, got the role, did five years, just over five years with FDM and National Grid. Uh, and then I I moved to JP Morgan Chase in the major incident management space. And that's where I am now. Great. OK, thank you very much. So really interesting. It's it's funny. I'm a huge advocate for um, X forces coming into the major incident space in particular. Um, it's interesting, but I think it's much more recognised, and, and companies are particularly large corporates really smart now. They have whole programs designed to, to help people transfer. Because I think the the training that most receive in the military is just phenomenal, and the experience that you get, particularly if you've been on tours, I think is is prepares you so well for anything else in the commercial world because it's naturally um, going to be in order of magnitudes more serious when you're in the forces on tour. Um, so trying to deal with anything in the commercial world suddenly kind of pales in comparison. And in fairness, Adam, I did think it was very daunting when I left. You know, I, mean, I didn't really have, have an idea of where I wanted to go because like you've just said, uh, that my certainly my 22 years in the signals, I've done jobs outside the signals you know i've done i've been seconded to other people um you know and but the key factor for me for for being ex-military was every two years the, the, from the minute i became a senior nto in 2005 up until i left in 2013 every two years i moved into a different role never moved into the, the same role it was always a different role um so you get the, you hit the ground running all of the time. So it gave me that sort of peace uh, for when I left. Um, and, and I'm going to mention a bit about FDM. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be. It's not an unashamed plug, but for that, but for them, I don't know where I'd be because a lot of people leave in the army. Not have many, many different facets and and you know areas that they could do and they're really good at the skill set is is phenomenal from the army because you get all of the most companies have a mission statement now and if you look at their mission statement it's all about integrity honesty you know all of the key factors that that that, that, that make you strive for any company you know and that's the mili military put that into you so i had that but when i left i just didn't have a clue i didn't really understand which which area to go in and like i said fdm is it, it, it just provided me the soft landing that you need when you've left the army after 22 years, um, you know, not really having many interviews, not not really doing much um, in 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 the interview space, or you know, and and then all the financial acumen piece, and it gave you gave gave me that, and then it it. it, it it farmed me out to National Grid, and, and I never looked back from there. I, you know, I found a niche in the service delivery space um, that I think military personnel are good at because they know the importance of getting things done in a timely manner. You know, under budget, what was is not never thought of in the army. But like I said, FDM give me that piece. You know, yeah. um, and, and 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 you know, and, and to do the best job you can. Um, and I think that's what FDM gave me. And but I already had all of them skills. I'm not saying you know they gave me the skills. I had them skills. I just needed they need they eat them out of me. So, and then when I did the service delivery manager piece at National Grid, I had a really good boss who who gave me the business acumen. You know, a, a lot of the most of the services at National Grid were outsourced. So. So okay. there's just, you know, all of the, you know, service reviews, multiple service reviews monthly with different service providers, uh, you know, give you that, gave me that, um, the background in, you know, SLA type type space. So, yeah, I, I think um, 
it's really interesting. I don't, I'm sure it does somewhere. I don't, I don't come across it much anymore. There used to be this really odd stigma. I can re remember probably about a decade ago, it was, was still true in the corporate world. If you either had people who are real advocates for, for X forces staff because they took the time to understand how good the training was. And as you say, the, the teamwork aspect that people are taught where you have to rely on the other people within the forces, particularly during your training that builds, is so useful in a corporate environment, particularly really large corporates where the complexities of massive companies um, and the politics start to jump in, which is quite hard to avoid when a company is just so large. I think um, having people who really get teamwork and, and strive for good teamwork and understand how effective it is, is is so powerful. But there used to be this stigma, at least I, I think there was and used to, used to see it, of people would have be either very pro X forces or they would um, not be very aware of what it actually means and have this blanket statement of, well, they're so used to following instructions um, they can't possibly work in a more dynamic environment like the commercial, which is laughable when you when you really get to understand. And, and particularly if you have friends in the military forces who are um, prepared to speak openly about kind of the, the training and their experience and the, the, the good things, the bad things, um, which I think has disappeared, which is great because I think people who come... It's interesting. I liken it, while I appreciate they're not the same thing, I liken the discipline to, to top-level martial artists in that there is a discipline, or even any any high-level competitive sports people have, of this real won't-quit attitude, grit, and discipline to excellence that I think you see come with not all, but the majority of people from the forces, which is just so powerful in a commercial entity. Um, so I'm a huge advocate, and, and we're going to be doing more actually in this in in this space in numerous companies um, to try and support people coming out. Because I think there's a real in major incident management in particular, there's a lack of fresh talent coming through. Um, I think some of that's because there wasn't a massive community around it, which means that if you weren't already in the role, it, sometimes you didn't even know about it if your company didn't have that function. And I think one of the best places companies who are looking for talented people yet they can mold to their systems and their way of doing things i think the forces um is just about the best place to get them from um and yeah as i say that some companies recognize this and have whole programs um but you're, you're kind of off to a huge start instead of taking people perhaps internally who are inexperienced in what you want um they're just inexperienced they haven't really had much real world experience at all you've got someone who's got all these these skill sets that essentially you can just kind of shift a little bit to the commercial world um and so yeah i'm, I'm a huge advocate but so re really interesting that you've that you found that so um what would you say we, we'll get into we'll go into a bit more detail what would you say the th the things that you most rely on and have contributed to your success in the commercial world um are that you essentially learnt through through serving in the forces? From a commercial aspect, I think that what I, I learned really quickly because in the in the military, like I said, you get a lot of um, you do get a lot. You, you get given the tools in the military. You still have to do the project piece and still have to get the, the project delivered, but you get given the tools. Whereas in uh, in the business areas, like so, I learned quite quickly in the business areas that you know. Every, every service review I did was always based on continual service improvement. So are we getting the correct value for what we're paying for? Um, and I was quite fortunate when I was in that role at National Grid. I did We did a, um, a benchmark of, of a company. Uh, so National Grid decided to benchmark companies just to see what, you know, equivalent to everyone else. So I got to see a lot more in detail um of what actually goes into some you know sort of contract negotiations exactly the really nitty gritty level and it was it was massive it was huge and but the army taught me to get to get a grip of things straight away so always get a handle on it and never sit there always think and ask people if you don't know what you're doing get your get somebody to help you and there was always plenty of people teamwork in the army was was what got you through it so Knowing something's important to do, you know, you, in the military, you, you get on and do it. But but 
but when you still face that in when you hit you know the business areas the proper you know commercial business areas and you actually physically see how much that's going to cost them or something like that you know you, you know that, that you're very customer focused so you know that, that that needs to be meticulously checked and that's what the military gives you it gives you that moving every couple of years going into a new role having to adapt quickly to that new role and then identifying these really, you know, I call it low-hanging fruit to start with. You know, you get all of the easy bits out of the way when you take over a role and then you really start digging and digging and digging. And that's what the military taught me. Never stop to net be, be, get, only start when you know there's nowhere else to go. So from a commercial perspective in, in, at National Grid, I certainly did a lot of digging into a lot of services that we didn't require. And, I, you know, I, I would like to say that me and the team saved a fair bit of money uh, over the, them couple of years I was there in the service delivery space because we dug and dug and dug and dug until we got to the very bottom. That That's a really interesting synopsis of, of it because I think you still see that with very experienced people in the commercial world that actually when they've been in a role for a long time, perhaps haven't moved much, or even a, a particular company with a way of doing things, even if they move to a parallel, so it's the same type of role, but they move into a new company and suddenly they don't have the same relationships to rely on, they don't quite know the exact process. You see the stress levels of a lot of people really rise. And I think it's interesting because there's an assumption that, oh, well, they were successful at X company, they're going to come and do the same role here. My experience, it, particularly of, of more senior people, is actually that's not always true. They do struggle with that piece of going, well, there's an element of uncertainty and chaos in here, which aligns perfectly to major incident management. Um, but m my key thing here is I need to get a handle on the situation, figure out what are the main priorities, and then focus on each one and really drive through, like you say, with that grit and determination, to sort those things in order instead of trying to, say, focus on everything at once um, and then dig into the more complex stuff, as you say. I, I think that's re a really useful skill and something that isn't quite as common as you'd expect, um, which, is, which is interesting, I think, because that's if you've got a good level of intelligence you have an idea of what you're doing but you have that kind of grit determination and the focus um particularly when things are uncertain um that's a really powerful combination and eventually that kind of person is always going to figure something out whether it takes them slightly longer or not those kind of things where we're often asked um by, particularly by clients but actually by the community by hiring managers they say what do you look for in major instant managers and those are some of the first things we list. We're like, look, if someone's got a, a good level of intelligence and they're eager with the right attitude, you can teach them anything. So don't worry about certain skill sets. Um, worry about this grit, determination, and the ability to focus in uncertainty. Um, those are the things that are quite hard to teach, um, and, and particularly in later life um, for more experienced hires. Um, so that's that's really interesting. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, you were really interesting. So when I when I reached out to you and, and we were talking about you coming on, um, I said, are there any topics you wanted to focus on? And, and you were saying, well, actually, I want to look at the wider service management piece and how major instant management actually focuses on that and engages with it. And I would say that's a really interesting topic because there's a, quite a big disconnect, even in companies who are fairly mature in their major instant function, um, we've done some work, you, you won't have seen this yet, but um, we've done some work, we've built um, this whole continual improvement methodology called the MIM Stakeholder Experience. And it's, it's basically, it's all around visual design and design thinking. So it is, um, there's about five tools in it, there's 10 steps. And basically it shows you how to analyze your stakeholders, but then look at your major instant process, what's going on, on at every single step of that process with the stakeholders in mind so you're also looking at every single step what they're seeing thinking doing hearing in their environment when the major incident is taking place and it's really 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 useful for bringing people outside of what they think they know and what they think they know about the stakeholders versus the reality of what's going on um so it's 
that's we find that massively transformative for people at all levels people are heading major instant functions um cios in some cases and the 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 operational major instant managers um and it really shifts their perspective about how they're looking after their customers how they're looking after the end users and even their colleagues um which is so i was really interested you're one of the first people we talked to a lot of people but who had said no i want to look at this and the other aspect actually is take on for major instant management um bringing new services or functions um into the live bau piece when there is already an existing major instant function because you find some managed service providers are good examples of this in that they have let's say a large shared service major instant function and it runs really well um they've been doing it for a long time but every time they bring on a new customer and the slight tweaks to that process the take on is not great so the the for example the pre-contract due diligence seems to miss out major instant management it goes to all the other functions or practices but major instant management gets this kind of light piece thrown around it and possibly even no sign off and so they struggle initially and the customer's expectations aren't quite met um so i'm absolutely fascinated and been slightly obsessed with improving that for companies um for quite a while but so um in your experience for for the wider service management piece what would you say are like the the five th- key things that are missing um that major instant management is just completely missing um when they're trying to bring on new services new functions um or new processes i'm not sure i've got five but let's let's see how let's as we go i don't think major instance missing anything i think major instant function is is the function we are there our primary job is to restore service in the quickest time possible regardless of anything else so i wouldn't i wouldn't suggest that major instance missing anything but i think i think companies are i think businesses are because from my experience and i'm talking about my experience in the military as well where there was a lot of things went wrong in the military because they just didn't have the knowledge you know ITIL was relatively new to the military not so long since you know so fortunately they're there now and they've got you know good processes and good practices but they didn't before the same with other companies I've worked for the the actual beginning of of the issues for any app or service in my eyes and i'm just talking from my personal experience so other people may have different ideas is and i learned this um i learned this at, at national grid the design to operate focus so in the design phase of, of your uh, of vital you you design the service you know it's the, the the business say I want this, and then all the all the guys get together and girls get together and they create what what they so you know it's fit for use. Um, sorry, it, it's fit for purpose, isn't it? So, but the the everything else that goes round that service is missed. As in, do you have the twenty four hour, you know, SLA with the with the resolver groups to if it goes wrong. Uh, you know that they'll come and fix it do you have the correct focus of you know do you have a service desk or a help desk with that company you know none of that is captured i don't think well i know sorry no. i i'll rephrase that a lot of time that is missed so that's one key thing you know the service wrapper that goes with a service that is missed um or the expectations of that service wrapper for, by the business is missed yeah, so the business think yeah, they've got a twenty four seven wrap, but really they've only got an eight hour wrap Monday to Friday. Well, that's not good for the business because they of a weekend and of a night. So that piece for me is one thing. So the design to operate, there should be a list of things that the, the company, not the not the business area, who want that device, because all business areas like shiny new apps and services that help them with their job that's their goal their continual service improvement piece is to make things better and easier for their their guys and girls who work for them well that's where i think people are getting it wrong is we're not doing that the design to operate is not working it's not fit for purpose you're missing out all of these key elements Mm -hmm. that by the time we get it as a major incident manager we identify it but it's already live it's already in production 
Uh, and yeah. and the business don't want to pay any more money for it. So um, so they've already paid for the product. They've got the product they've asked for, but they haven't got all of the the rest of it. So that's that's key for me. Is is I I think I think you're 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 so accurate with that. Um, I guess I'd echo that in in again. We're so fortunate to see so many companies um, and, and leading companies, but we still see that misalignment of the SLAs and OLAs and and it, it works for all the services individually but when you then have a major instance and you line it up with what's expected of a major instant function you're like well even with third parties for example you're like yeah they don't have to respond for eight hours and and you only as you say you find that out operationally so the poor major instant manager who's running it finds that out during that that first major instant that uncovers it um and and yeah i think if you were to look at the services individual i completely echo that um and that seems to transcend countries so, so pretty much wherever we are that's that's a really common issue so brilliant okay great so so the design to operate is key i believe then one of the second things the most important thing for me uh, I, it's not necessarily uh echoed in the current job I'm in because there's so I mean at JP Morgan there's so much going on there's so many teams managing all of that stuff because you know JP Morgan's a very very techno technology driven firm it, it invests millions every year into technology because it understands but there's not a lot of companies that do that so because obviously it's new. You you hit the nail on the head a little earlier when you said, you know, the major instant piece is a little strange. It's still a little bit. And I think your teams and your podcasts and your um, excerpts going on, on LinkedIn are showing people exactly what major instant is about. Uh, and it's enlightening people. I know a lot of people from National Grid who subscribe to it, who are not even in the major instant space because it's it's something they're interested in to help them in their business areas because they work for the business you know so so that that's quite key to me that, sorry uh, to, sorry to stop you that that's extremely humbling very very kind thank you it's what what's what's weird is i've actually i've run companies for a, a number of years in in various um areas i've never really um had any desire to be a public face and it's been really strange um to actually have to go on camera and so i i prefer to work behind the scenes to be honest and, and i fully recognize i couldn't do any of the things i do without the the team we've got here and also the community and people like yourself um who, who want to be involved and bring it to the forefront but i'm i'm even now as far as far on as we are and and as many countries we operate in and types of clients i'm still really humbled every time people say actually we find what's what you're doing really interesting it's really valuable and helping um so it's really kind of you to say so thank you um but yeah i think it's it's really important work though i think the whole industry desperately needs this apps and and that's my th that's that's why i'm i'm sort of praising you and your team because there's so much not known about major instant management. Um, and by you doing this, you're letting the business areas of every company know that, you know, what a major instant manager should be doing. Uh, I been on major instant bridges in the past where people are expecting me to fix their issues. Well, that's not what a major instant manager does. A major instant manager drives the resolution by utilizing all the resolvers, internal and external, to get it fixed. Uh, you know that's the job. But you know, and I think you mentioned in one of your in one of your um, excerpts around we blame ourselves. A good major instant manager blames themselves when things don't get fixed quickly, and 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 that's that's true. That is absolutely true. Every single instant I go on, um, I think. Why haven't I fixed this? It's been a couple of hours now. You know, why is this not fixed? But is that my job to fix it? Is it not the people you pay a lot of money for to manage your service? Is it not their job? It's my job, I think, to drive them into certain directions and certain work streams, which you get with a bit of knowledge. But I think too much knowledge is dangerous. Yeah. 
you know, if you're on an incident for two or three hours, you're already way over where you should be. Yeah, that's how much business productivity has gone down the pan because of that. So you're already in dangerous waters with the business. But but should you then be exacerbating that by trying to get too technical, trying to be technical, trying to talk technical, when you really should be doing your work stream and move on to a different work stream, get that done, get that covered, get the next work stream. So, you know, I, I think your podcasts and all of your what are they called? I don't even know what they're called. What, just the con- content. Yeah, yeah, just, 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 you know, okay. you just, you, your posts, all of the posts, they just hit the nail on the head of exactly where we need to go in Major Instant. And I haven't, I, I must admit, I haven't watched all of them. Oh, wow, well, you'd be there for a while. No, no, no one expects that. <laughs> no, but I haven't, I haven't watched all of them, but I've not, not the, but all of your posts. But every time I flip over one or skim over one, I do that anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I know that it's a, it's the right way to do things because I'm doing it the right way because your um, posts are from your team, yours and your team's posts and from other and other people are, are saying that we're doing it correct. So, yeah. I, th- so I, th- I that- think it's interesting. I think um, it was handy that I, I, I had very good teachers. Um, this is a long time ago now, like a decade and a half, who – I mean, Andrew Richardson, um, I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name. When I, when I was at Fujitsu and I was a youngster, I was like a long time ago, I was like 21, maybe 22. Um, he, he was, he was a rugby lad, um, quite a bit older than me. And he had, which is what I say about sports. He really understood teamwork. He was a very good leader. He was also a, a really decent person, um, lots of integrity. And so I had a really good model, I think of, of, someone who is a good leader which meant that naturally I I started to emulate I looked up to Andy I I started to emulate pretty good leadership qualities um, without realizing just because I I had a good example of that and I think as as I wrote in the first publications for this and as we were designing the first early courses what I realized was that as an industry, for years, we've been so obsessed with process and the technology that supports it. What we hadn't realized is major instant management is a pure leadership leadership role. Yet I saw almost no examples of any companies teaching soft skills, leadership skills, emotional intelligence, relationship management, conflict. And that this is going back to what you're saying about the military. Um you're thrown into far more dangerous, complex situations with much higher consequences than than will ever be seen in the commercial world. So those things you're like stress tested really, really well for for dealing with um, emotionally charged situations and lots of complex people. Um, and people are normally the most challenging bit. And and so I think um, I think the fact that we really understood it was a leadership role and it deserved the same respect and the training deserved the same time and energy that you'd perhaps um take a really senior leader who who you want to to have and and create high performing teams i think that's partly why the company's done so well um because of the value it's created for companies and i think we just forgot that as an industry we forgot that and how valuable that can be because it's harder to man it's harder to measure in a lot of ways but like you say i think the only caveat and and we don't tend to deal with many small organizations which is why you'll always hear me talk about the major instant manager should really stay away at least at a low level the technical stuff and focus on the leadership because you're you're bringing together many collective powerful brains of people who have specialized for years in individual technologies and so the, the brain power you have behind that so your job really is just to look after them and make sure they're communicating well with one another you're you're smoothing over any possible conflicts so that they're all constantly engaged and contributing i think the only caveat is when you're talking about very small companies who have like dual role meaning that the person might be a senior technical person or an opera and they just don't have the budget or 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 even necessarily the downtime to to have a dedicated major instant manager um but i 100 percent agree with you i think it's i i said something a while ago um the idea that you as an individual major instant manager 
could possibly have enough knowledge in every technical expertise when people who have done nothing but that still have to specialize and ultimately focus on one thing or a couple of things when they're much further in their career and that kind of, they're that kind of level where they're really up there. So the idea that we as major instant managers could even dream of being able to be that competent across that many technologies um, and services is just mad. Um, but I think there's a realization particularly recently and I think it's been interesting watching we've done some baselining with companies before we've we've delivered training for example and um it's really interesting because they they love seeing the improvement in in things like mean time to resolve etc but the biggest thing they comment on once their people particularly are trained in in the soft skills and the leadership elements is how much happier the customer is customers absolutely love it when your operational team are suddenly um really in touch with um, tailoring their communications to different personality styles and their really understanding of the nuances and of the complexities of people. I think it's really interesting. But um, please, please, please go on. Any, any, any other? Um... Yeah. So, like you know, the, the subject. You know, that is a, just another good piece of uh, to me what needs to be right. You know, you need to get the right level of of, of managing that incident, like you've just alluded to. You know, so that's that's another sort of key piece in the in the entire service management piece um you know also collaboration um and i don't just mean with other major incident managers because i i mean with all other fu functions within the it service management tool so you've got your change management you've got your problem management uh to some extent you've got your availability management um, but you know that it all depends where you are, and you've got your service owners that actually product owners essentially, um, and then you've got you know the the big the biggest collaboration is the problem team, you know. So, but it, it really worked at National Grid. We had a we had a daily meeting an, an IT service management meeting every day, where we discuss it'd be a quick meeting. It was a quick meeting. It was not, you know, it was, but it was very relevant. One of the few meetings you go to that you actually think you get something out of, because a lot of people do a lot of meetings, don't yeah. they? I think uh, across the across the piece, um, and where you'd sit with your teams and you'd be sitting close. I had a, a national grid. I, I must admit, I, I've never seen it before, but uh, you know, because in the military you just collaborate with everybody. You know, you're in an ops room of ninety hundred people, and you're always talking to all of them because they all manage some some of a fun some form of a function. But that was the same as at National Grid. I had a really close relationship with the problem team. So Sai was Simon was our the, the problem lead at the time, but he had some real cracking problem managers who were absolutely inundated all the time because you know at the at major instances a lot of them occur so they've got a lot of work to do because you know whereas we manage the incident within an hour hopefully or quicker they've then got several hours of meetings with teams external uh, resolvers internal resolvers uh, and then the from mac the corrective actions come out uh, and you know we never get any corrective actions as uh, as as um you know as major incident managers we sort of drive the corrective actions by what we've put for our post incident piece yeah. so you know so so but that collaboration was really good and then you had our change teams that would they'd, they'd we knew when really important changes were coming on we've got a similar thing at jp every week we get our change guy who's, who's really good pings us over you know all of the 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 changes that are coming in the weekend and if there's any questions you know you know he's on the end of end of a phone if you need to get hold of him you know mike he, he's pretty good like that so that's sorry that sorry sorry to stop you that is that is such an important yet underrated and underutilized thing for major instant managers and um, we we always talk about this like you need to be aware of the forward schedule of change um because they're still they're still the 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 reason for so many major incidents but it's such a simple thing to do but that's often so overlooked um and and time is wasted trying to figure something out and actually it's like, okay it's related to to this change um we're just not yeah it's really underutilized. So sorry to stop you, but that's just a real key point yeah. for a lot of people that that 
should be a very basic part of your role. That should be one of the first places you're looking the second something happens. So, so that's that's what I'm saying. The collabor- collaboration piece, it, because we're major instant managers, we don't, we people are not expecting us to collaborate. Uh, you know, we're there. We're, our main function is to you know reduce MTTR. That's all, that's it. You know, get the thing fixed. Whatever's broke, fix. Uh, and that's our function. But you know, uh, my place I'm at now, National Grid. There's a, there's a you know a PIR. There's a post incident review on every major incident. Um, you're never always going to get to the bottom of it. But a key piece for major incident managers is to make sure you capture that information. You know, yeah. so so you know, so that is the other big thing. I really enjoyed that collaboration piece and. I think it saved quite a lot of work yeah. and a lot of um, major incidents because we actually spend time doing that. Different companies are different, obviously, but um, yeah. So that was that's the key. Um, I can't really, I can't really think of another f- key p- point. No, they're they're pretty. Probably. That's uh, they're pretty strong. Um, yeah, no, re- really important things. Really important. So I'd be I'd be really interested. I mean. In, in our experience, so particularly going back like three years, um, finance as an industry was one of the first to really engage with us and, and be quick and early adopters of the global best practice and IT major instant management. I think a couple of reasons. One, particularly if you have um, any kind of asset management and trading platforms, um, obviously the potential is, is yeah, just huge if you have an outage um, in lost opportunity or being unable to, to essentially react quickly to market forces. Um, you, yeah, hundreds of millions could be lost. But, um, but so it's been really interesting for us seeing both retail banks um, and asset management companies be so quick to adopt. Um, I think they're very good at quantifying impacts, which most... Um, and not fully because it's still quite a, a difficult balance of science and art. There's a combination of the two. If you're going to capture all the things, um, including kind of productivity, even potentially um, reputational damage um, and, and market share um, if your instant goes public. But um, it, it's, it's really interesting um, looking at the banks and how a lot of them are transforming how they're looking at major instant management and how seriously they take the function. They're a pretty good example to pretty much every other industry um, as to how to really do major instant management well and how seriously it should be taken and the investment it actually requires to have a good functioning major instant team. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, what did you see as kind of the main differences between National Grid through to JP Morgan? Um, what did you see like from the major instant piece? Were there really obvious differences? Or it sounds like National Grid was still run very well and, and, and your previous company was run very well, but there must have been some quite significant differences. I would honestly, I, I'm going to stick with the the... Uh, the, the you know the, the the main focus for for major incident managers is to fix things, and I don't believe it changes wherever you go. The level of pressure changes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. You know, a uh, national grid, I'd get one or two execs on. Um, you know, and a JP, you get a lot more because it's a lot more different. It's a it's a bigger bigger environment, um, and the, and and they're more complex. But you're still doing the basic, capturing, you know, the work streams, capturing, you know, where you are in, within the incident, what phase you're in. You know, the first 15 minutes is nothing to do with anyone else but you and getting hold of everybody. And then after that, everybody else joins. So I, I'm honestly going to say, and I don't know whether I'm, it's right or not, I really don't see the, the, the difference. The only difference I see is that it's a bit more pressure because there's a lot of money involved. Uh, in a lot of this, I mean, you know, some of the incidents you're on, you're like, wow, you know, with the, with the actual, f- you know, projected um, yeah. in business impacts. Um, but then saying that, at, at, at National Grid, I was dealing with blue light incidents, yeah. you know, incidents that had to be, you know, you know, stuff that the, the, the actual people on the ground, the actual you know, would were in danger. So 
yeah there's there's a sort of measurement and over like i said other than probably a little bit more pressure uh here uh because of the amount of money um but how i manage the incident just it hasn't changed it's just it's just become bigger it's become a, so it's grown exponentially but and everything's grown but the way you fix it or the way you try to restore service is exactly the same. I don't know. What no, do I, I, I absolutely agree. But I think um, your thoughts on that are probably more indicative of the, the grit that you've developed probably from, from the X forces. Cause I would suggest that actually that on its own, the increased pressure for a lot of people, you do see a complete transformation of their ability to lead and so you'll find major in- the, the, i think what's really interesting you go to a lot of companies and you see people have been doing major instant management for a long time even at a number of commercial entities and they they would believe that they're doing major instant management up here but you then engage with them and you go actually well okay are you tailoring your communication to different types of people how do you deal with very assertive or even borderline aggressive um, executives coming on the call when you're trying to manage so 100 100 people you've got technical staff everywhere all over the place and actually they kind of realize they have this momentary realization of actually I'm, I'm probably somewhere in the middle i'm not doing what perhaps some of my counterparts who are very experienced are doing in banks um like jp morgan chase who actually really are dealing with that kind of or or exhibiting that kind of level of leadership so i'd suggest for a lot of people where companies often engage us actually because of the soft skills that's a really common problem they have they're like um, this person is a phenomenal major instant manager but the second our execs get involved or someone with um perceived seniority is involved and is slightly dominant they struggle to keep that kind of command and control element and that's typically the types of major incidents that fall apart so i'd say it's for, for you that not changing i think that's more a credit to your skill set and the fact that you're able to deal with that level of pressure um, particularly over a sustained like multiple decades um, i would say lots of people struggle um, but yeah, yeah. I, I agree the fundamentals don't change at all they really don't. If anything, they become more important. And the fact that you have a process um, and a system of actions and this kind of mental tool belt, essentially, of ha- how to lead and how to deal with other people and manage conflict becomes even more essential. But no, I'd, I'd, I'd fully agree with you. I don't, I think, you. don't think you're wrong yeah. at all. I think you're absolutely No, right. no, it does. It does. But one, one key element I missed there in that my analogy of, of major instant for, you know, financial services is you get more support on them kind of incidents so you know you'd have there wouldn't just be one major incident manager you'd have a product production manager on your boss your regional manager would join it's that level yeah. you get the so, so you know in the military it's called mutual support yeah um and that's exactly what you you get you get that mutual support from other people so where you are a little bit overawed by the senior execs the senior managers that join uh, who are obviously the only thing they want is to fix everything you you do still have a support model that will will assist you in that so you know that's that's what i meant by no yeah. different you like you know you get better support you know even at national grid you know if one of the instant managers was struggling other incident managers would would join and assist. That's the whole point of major yeah. incident management as a function. Yeah. You mutually support each other. So I wasn't really being blasé about it, but after I know you're not, you, you didn't think I was, but after listening to what you said, I felt maybe I was a bit more flippant with, no, with no, my I, response. I don't, I don't, I don't think it, <laughs> but it's not no, no, mutual support. I don't think it was know? flippant at all. I think it's a real credit to you and your leadership skills um, that you're able to kind of still remember its fundamentals regardless of how much pressure is added in this um this got to roll back no i don't think it was flippant i think it was just a credit to your your skill set one of the things we see with particularly less experienced major instant managers or people who have not had the opportunity to really kind of learn some proper well-established leadership skills and soft skills is they go down the 
um, authoritarian route of leadership. And so um, they, they perhaps look at it like the police officer arriving at, at, say, a traffic incident where they don't want any input. They know what they want to happen um, and they're not really inspiring any collaboration. And the problem is that actually works in the short time, term sometimes. If someone's confident enough, they can slightly bulldoze um, the rest of the personalities. But, but naturally, even if that works for a couple of major incidents, you want to win over the next like thousand major incidents or hundred that you're going to deal with. And that's a team sport. The only way you can do that is by having these collective brains everywhere involved. And there is no way you can do that on your own, um, particularly in the sorts of organisations that we're talking about. There's so many moving parts, um, and which is why we say like the relationships you develop as a major incident manager, like that's how you win. And spending the time outside of major incidents to build those with people is where you really win and build like kind of long lasting um, mutual um, assurance of success for everyone. And you just you just can't do it on your own. So no, I I think it's it's brilliant that you've kind of really hammered that point home because it, it is it's probably the most common mistake we see is with newer or, or less experienced major incident managers is relying heavily on kind of a dominant personality and forgetting that that actually like you want people to feel comfortable enough on calls where they can put ideas out there and even challenge one another um, in the right way. And so that we kind of get the best best plan of action um, and put it. So no, I, I think you almost can't underestimate that enough. And again, it comes back to the process side, where companies were so focused on process that you get someone that's quite process driven. So much so they forget the people element. I, I, I I'm really big on process. I really do think process is a is a fantastic thing. Yeah. It gives you the parameters of where you should work but that parameter should never interfere yeah. with actually getting getting something done as long as it's done correctly of course you know a lot of inc incidents you, you know there's a lot of changes in incidents but they're you know they're managed because they have to be and there's a process for that as long as the process doesn't interfere and doesn't hamper the, the remediation of something and i mean like hamper it just because you have to get this one person, you know, if the process says you need this one person's, yeah. well, that's not a process. If you rely on one person for a process, then that's not a process. That's just somebody, you know, wanting to take control. So, so what, yeah, so I'm really, I am quite for process driven because you get, you've got to give the team the, the, the left and right of arc, uh, as we say yeah. in the military and then let them go. And, 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 and if they make a mistake, then it yeah. gets washed. You, 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 when you do your wash up at the end, you know, which everybody does, you know, a lot of we have when we have sever, sever one incidents, there's always a wash up at the end of it, and you go through the good points and you go through the bad points, and and then everyone goes right, we'll do better next time because that's what you do, and and then you know, so that's why I am quite process driven, only because of that, because you know, I, I don't think you like, have to be, as, as you said, you can't. When you're talking about companies the size of JP Morgan and and if you haven't got a common language and a common understanding between all the people who are going to be involved in some capacity in a major instance, um, you're adding to the complexity. And the process does that for you. It gives you a really shared language of okay, these are this is the terminology. Because in our world we're terrible for for creating so many acronyms and, and and terminology that's exclusive to a particular function or service, but but you, so you need everyone talking the same language and everyone understanding what should happen and when. But I completely agree. Um, major instances are some of the most. There's so much ambig ambiguity of information, and you're never you you have to make decisions, but you can't afford to wait for all of the information at all times, or nothing would happen. So you're definitely going to have to move in and out slightly of the process but without that whole shared understanding well you're you're naturally going to take longer and add more complexity anyway and i'm a massive it, advocate for the for marketing major instant functions internally meaning the major instant team or representatives from it periodically go and um, essentially do road shows to all of the technical staff who are involved to the product owners to the service managers particularly when there's been changes so that everybody understands oh, okay that's what should be happening 
Well, that, that that's key to me as well. Uh, that's just res- resonated with me because the major instant process, it does change. You know, we are fluid. The whole, every time you have an incident, it's different and, and you've got to be fluid. So doing what you were saying there, I think helps people to understand that there isn't any hard and fast rules to ma- major incidents. I mean, that's another military sort of saying, but there is, there's, there's processes and parameters, there's guidelines, so to speak. Yeah. And then you get the red areas, which are extant, must never change. But the majority of major incident yeah. is is ever moving. It's ever fluid. And, and, and I think that's why major incident managers should do what you said, should, should actually, you know, enlighten other business areas just so that they understand exactly how fluid everything is and it allows less pressure on calls because then the businesses are the business areas are happy with you know the way things are going because they've had a I, I i i probably wish i could have done that more at national grid to be fair um being as the the the, the, the major incident function was was only sort of like a year old when i joined it yeah. Uh, and it was brilliant, full of top class major incident managers, real big hitters, you know. And I learned quite a lot off them. Um, but you know, so but I wish we'd have gone out more and and engaged the stakeholders more with it, and and said yeah. sort of said, this is what we do, this is what we're doing. But it, it was forever fluid, and it was a forever moving. But there's always key points that are the same. You know? I th- yeah, I yeah, I think um, the probably one of the biggest places that helps is with end user representatives like service assurance people or service managers or pro- product managers, if you're in an organization where they're not necessarily joining each of the major instant calls, you have this disconnect in that if they don't understand what's supposed to happen when and they're not, for example, in the same physical location, they don't see anything. They might see your communications, but let's say it's been half hour. How would they know if they don't have a good understanding of the process that actually the whole operation's mobilized and action plans being formed and, and work is happening? For them, it just feels like an eternity of nothing's happening and they're potentially the ones dealing with the end users, which is why you end up with this odd scenario of, let's say, service managers or, or product owners going direct to technical staff and trying to kind of circumnavigate major instant managers because they don't understand that actually that's what's happening. And that's kind of our fault in terms of we're the ones that can give them that level of comfort and support so that they get it and they're like, oh, okay. Um, and also that we're, we we need to be the ones building the relationship because it's our function. Um, so it's our responsibility. But going back to that. And one of our... No, please. Sorry, but, one of our key functions, I believe, is assurance, providing yeah. assurance to the people on the call that you're actually managing. That's massive key. I used to get pings on in a previous role. I used to get pings on Skype around. Oh, Jace, we're going nowhere here. You know, nobody's getting the. Or, and then when you dig into it, the instant manager's said what's going on, and you know it's all going well, but he's not provided that assurance on the call. That we are actually, you know, what like so, you know, when you're investigating things, it takes a while for the techies to investigate, mm. you know, and so there's moments and periods of silence on the call because of that, you know. Uh, but if you're not constantly saying this is where we are, there's a level set, then you get you lose that confidence with uh, you know service owners or customer service managers or or key stakeholders on that call and you know that, I, I needed to make that point yeah. because i thought that's quite key you've got to provide uh, you know the assurance to the stakeholders on the call that we've taken into consideration everything that they hold dear yeah, yeah. so because everybody's got their own point of what everybody's got their own objective when they're on a call yeah, yeah, yeah. so as long as you've captured them objections then uh, you know uh, their objectives. Then then uh, you know that gives them the assurance to say, right, okay, good, we know where we are. Well, it, it, yeah, it changes the dynamic, so it stops things like um, leadership potentially feeling like they have to take over, um, which often slows down resolution, um, and it stops internal conflict. I think it's really important people remembering that actually, even if there is conflict, we all want the same thing. 
Um, and, and does this person really want me as a major instrument manager to fail? No, they want me to succeed, which might be why they are potentially um, kind of trying to take over. They want the same thing. And yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a really interesting piece that again has been left out of major instant management um, for a long time. But what, what's, what's really interesting, so in um, version three of the publication um, is going to be out, it's been delayed due to COVID and printing, um, but is going to be out this year. And um, many will know even prior to us that, that a, a pretty commonly agreed objective or the objective of major instant management was to restore normal service operation um, as quickly as possible via workaround or permanent fix. Well, in version three, we've expanded to add in whilst maintaining stakeholder confidence. And that's that's how, yeah, that that that's how strongly that's we important. feel about yeah. that. And it's Definitely. such a simple change, but the mindset and everything that essentially goes into that is so important. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's one of the very small updates um, in version three is absolutely that because we recognize how vital it is um, to get that right. But it's, it's, um, it's really fun industry, isn't it? I mean, if you're, you can see your passion coming through when you're talking about it. And I think there are, people who are just built for this i think there are people who really enjoy it they enjoy the buzz they enjoy the pressure um and i think it's quite quite special when you find people that are that passionate about this um and i think they're a real asset to companies i i, I honestly believe that why would anybody put up with the frustrations the stress because I've never been on a major incident that hasn't been somewhat stressful huh. with somewhat with some with people with uh, you know shall I say quite high high emotions. Uh, why would you do that if you weren't passionate about it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. I, and I I'm a great believer of that. I think and that's why I am passionate about it. You know, I'm passionate about everything I do because that's what I think I've learned in the army. The better the more the more the more more you've got at stake, then the better you you are. The the more you're you know concerned. So uh, you know from I I it doesn't matter to me what incident I'm on because every major incident manager does a lot of what we what we say soft you know severity one or two, uh, soft severity three incidents. Yeah, they're not really in the major incident space, but but you do it because it could be, you know, it's a preventable, but we all do a lot of them. And I get just as much pleasure of, of fixing them as I do uh, out of, you know, my real sort of big hitter S, S3s, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and, and I think that's what I'm saying. So, so and I think most major incident managers uh, have that buy-in to major incidents. They are absolutely a key stakeholder in, in their own world. Uh, that's probably not the right word, key stakeholder. They are, you know, you, like you said earlier, that they... No, I think you are. We blame ourselves. I think we don't think when we don't fix things. Yeah. And most instant managers I know, certainly I know, uh, are of exactly the same ilk as I am. Yeah. You know? And even... even Which all wouldn't be in it. Yeah. Even when you've got a conflict, let's say there's there's... Um, a technical resolving group member who, who you're finding you've got a particularly contentious relationship with flipping it instead of kind of thinking which I, I think people can do in in kind of this win-lose scenario or I, my ideas need to win over theirs thinking well what is it that I've done as a major instant manager that means this person um, doesn't understand my communication or it's frustrated them so instead of thinking it's, it's them and against me, thinking I must have done something, I must have either not thought about their communication style or the things that stress, the stresses for this person, and I didn't tailor my communication style to them so that they understood the message. And again, if, if technical resolving groups are, members are missing like deadlines, for example, well, it's instead of going, well, they missed a deadline they committed to, saying, well, did I confirm with them in the first place that they were comfortable doing this? Did I check with them that they needed any support or more resource that I could have acquired for them? Did I check in with them well before 
the deadline was up to say how's it progressing and giving them the opportunity to call out early and also notify stakeholders before you've actually missed that deadline to say we're going to extend it and and it changes it completely changes the mindset when you kind of go what is it i've done wrong as a leader and and how can i be better and it, it, it just you see one of my great passions, I get to do slightly less training than I used to just because we've grown so much. I have to rely on the people that the world is. But when we do big global transformations for, for companies, particularly managed service providers, so you're talking like um, 50 upwards major instant managers and maybe training a lot of technical staff. So you end up in the hundreds of people that, that you're working with. I still get quite involved in those kinds of things. And one of my biggest pleasures is seeing someone who actually had all the raw talent anyway, they've just got new mental models, but seeing them have a eureka moment of, oh, this particular relationship I've got that's not been going very well, like let's say a service manager with my customer, oh, wow, actually I've got the power to completely change this. And then speaking to them, let's say like a month later, and they're like, oh, no, it's completely transformed the relationship, which in turn has transformed like, how quickly we're resolving this or, or how effective we are as a team. But I love seeing that. It's a real passion of mine. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. I think the second you lose that that drive and passion and and that that kind of selfless customer focus, whether it's internal, customer, external, I think that's the time to move on to a different role. Um, I think you just can't do do this well without being fiercely passionate about everyone you're kind of serving um, and that servant servant leadership. Bits. Hello. You know, and always learning, always wanting to learn, always wanting to get that, you know, to update and, and you know, refresh. And you know, I, I find that quite key as well. So, yeah. you know, you've got to be passionate about your job, but you've also got to want to keep continually learning. And, yeah. you know, and you, there's not, I mean, I, I'm, I, I believe I, I've still got a long way to go in the my current role before I'm as proficient as I want to be. You know, I, 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 but that, that's with every role you do, you do, and it, and, it, and it gets harder with the size of the company. So, you know, so as long as you know, I keep focused on improvement, 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 then I can't go wrong. And if I am going wrong, then I would hope that I would get the, um, you know, the, the somebody, you know, assist me in, in, in getting it right which is you know what you need in a team yeah well it goes it goes right back to that analogy of, of sports persons it almost doesn't matter what level they reach if you were to look behind the scenes of them they're constantly looking to improve and i think it breeds two things it breeds quite a humble mindset which is really useful to getting better at anything i think the second you feel that you've you've nailed it and you've got everything perfect is, is the second you're on a bit of a downward trend um but but also i think it resonates throughout the rest of your life so like i i i found we we play a bigger game now so like the same in in my career i actually love always learning and try and take everything as an opportunity to to kind of improve in all areas and i would never say that i'm kind of completely happy with my performance in anything i do even when we get some big wins and some successes but it actually keeps it really interesting as well particularly the things that i have to do over and over again it means that i'm more engaged all the time and the second i'm not trying to learn something new or trying to eke out some some more improvement um is the second that that i'm perhaps slightly less interested in what i'm doing and, and that's never good um so i think it just keeps it interesting but don't you find the parallels outside of our industry when you're tuned in are really useful. So I, I read quite a lot, but I find a lot of things outside of our industry, particularly in business are more useful. And like yourself, I learn very quickly. Um, and again, I think that's a thirst for knowledge, but also I'm, I'm quite an impatient person. So I'll push myself quite hard. Um, but I, I find looking at how, other businesses operate i've always had an interest in business but looking at business models looking at um leading designers looking at um, marketing for example looking at all those things i suddenly find these little nuggets that apply really well to major instant management that you kind of yeah you might throw away 90 percent of it but it's interesting but you find these things you think wow that's really quite powerful and um 
yeah, I definitely think it's just a way of being. And this is it goes back to why I was saying I'm a real advocate for people who are ex forces. I think there is a there is a grit, determination, and discipline that, when combined, is just so powerful to to achievement in anything, whether that's the commercial world or sporting endeavor. Um, I really and it's it's a hard thing to teach in, in the commercial world because. Um, it's easier to be blasé about the consequences when you're in a huge organisation and you're one of many, whereas you come from the ex-forces, you see the consequences of, of just how serious kind of lack of discipline can be and forgetting to work as a team. And I think there's almost no better example. But I, w- I would say that's why many business leaders love um, Love military books, love really good case studies of, of things going on in the military. I mean, Jocko Willink, have you heard of Jocko Willink? No. So he is, um, a, he's a retired Navy SEAL now. He owns, I think it's um, Echelon Front. It's like a management consultancy. And so he wrote a number of books, one of which called Extreme Ownership, which again, I, I talk about a lot, but it's a lot of lessons he learned read, from, yeah, it's Extreme I, Ownership. I read one of your, I read one of your, um links the other week and was that was that jock uh around the five navy seal um no it wasn't that was that was done a number of years ago i think it was moved to, to one of our main sites but um no it wasn't um but similar similar thing very very similar i mean he's he's just mentally a very tough smart resilient and also really high intelligence as a leader um and he talks a lot about like everything's his fault as a leader and he should have done something better and how extreme ownership is, is really powerful in everything you do. It changes the mindset and yeah. he's a yeah, very, very smart guy. And I definitely encourage people to, to listen to his content. And I mean, he goes and speaks at businesses now and is, is a bit of a celebrity in the circle. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I just think the mindset thing, everything else falls into place. Um, it's really powerful. So, um, so let, let's talk about um, JP Morgan. So in, in your business, how many major instant managers are you typically working alongside? Uh, we, we've got our shifts. We do, sh- obviously, uh, regional shifts, EMEA, NA and AP, roughly 10, 15 major instant managers, you know, per region. Um, but that is just for our uh, global technology infrastructure. Yeah. There are, all the other lines of business have their own major incident managers. Yeah. Um, so the the sort of goal for, I believe the goal for JP Morgan Chase is to bring us all together in, in, into a global incident command center, mm. um, which is really exciting because that's the collaboration piece that you're yeah. after uh, and working alongside other incident managers, you know, brings you on as well. You know, so yeah. so, but for so, you know, I predominantly work in the infrastructure space at the moment. Uh, but I'm we always join a higher severity incidents with the other LOBs, the other line of businesses. So you know, you, I, I could be on a you know a, a major incident um, with a massive amount of money as a support and major incident manager. So. So that's sort of the setup at, at, at JP Morgan yeah, yeah. Chase. Okay. Um, what's what does your kind of major instant tool stack look like? So, what are you using for communication? And we've got some. Uh, we're, we're making big, big leaps and big changes in in the in in that 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 sort of sphere around tooling. Uh, you know, we've got some good, real good applications, um, but they're all they're different applications for different you know what you need your different requirements so you have to go to these applications so it's not unusual to have three or four applications open for the similar so our team internally um not our team sorry the the gix uh so the sort of gti function is for jp morgan chase it is is adopting you know in-house um that will drag all of this information in one tool yeah so, so you know, so so all of that will, and, and we're going to get rid of all of the, you know, the great, really good applications for it, but 
as a major instant manager, I don't really want to be searching three or four different areas, yeah. three or four different apps. So, so we've got it right there. We're starting to bring it onto one application. So we use a couple at the moment. Obviously, we use um, – well, it's not obvious at all, but <laughs> we use ServiceNow. ServiceNow is – I don't know. I'd say that's that's becoming more obvious. It's a, it's, it's a big hitter, and obviously they've released their own major instant module recently. A lot of clients we do work with, they're obviously – um, very well respected um, in, in the wider IT great, piece. So, yeah, it is a great tool. It's a great tool for dragging information as well. So you know, we used it more. It was I used it at uh, National Grid, uh, and at National Grid, we used it for everything. We used it for service transition. You know, checking on service transition. Uh, service transition handover documentation to to make sure we had the right people you know it was used for everything it was also used for reporting but uh, but we then used we didn't use a at national grid we didn't use a, our own um service now module for the major instant piece we just used it to track you know the governance piece around uh, what you did on the incident uh we've slightly matured that at, at uh, jp morgan chase uh, whereas we've got our own sort of um, piece of service now that we use ourselves, and, and that's ever evolving, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, you're right. Uh, it's a really good tool for for anything, whatever yeah. you want to do. You just got to tweak it to what what you need. So that's my that's my favourite tool on uh, that we use. But there are other tools that I'm using at the moment that we've sort of adopted internally. So we've 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 made it uh, and it, it drags the information from other tooling okay are those are those tools that you've built in-house like self-developed applications or are you using no, anyone no, no, like no. pager duty or alert ops or everbridge any any no, any of those uh, providers well, well, no it, it's it's um it's just like a communication tool yeah um you know uh, we are using uh a uh, 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 a tool called Verum, which which drags the you know the infrastructure uh, piece around who you know the what what server it is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So great, okay. But what I'm saying is the the point I'm I think I'm making is there's so many tools and they're all good, but as a made for a focus of major instant, which you know we've got right, I think in our our place, we know where we need to go with it. We've we're creating an in-house tool that will drag everything we yeah. need into that one tool we should be able to do everything from it yeah. and that's the end goal that's the uh, yeah i mean that, that, that by the goal. way that that's really common even in really mature major instant functions it's is it's a, it's a struggle to get all the tools completely working in harmony in the the major instant manager the last thing you want particularly in the initial 15 minutes when you're trying to get out comms and just make people aware is to have to yeah utilize multiple or go to different pieces of kit or applications um you just want speed um and, and ease so that you can kind of actually think about yeah. the leadership piece um so yeah that's even even really mature companies that's really common we see that a lot um it's been interesting actually um one of the the big ones that's become a real trend and we're starting to see in a lot of well-known companies is the addition of slack um to, to people's kind of major instant t tool stack um, and actually how detailed that can be used for centralizing communications, particularly if you're documenting things. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that's a really interesting space because there's an ecosystem. It's not a massive one. There's some big players in it, but it's not widely known. Some of the work we've been doing is trying to bring that to the forefront in terms of companies actually being aware that there are specific major instant tools out there that can do a lot of heavy lifting for people particularly if they're well integrated um, in something like service now that can just increase speed and i'm still yeah. amazed e even by really again sophisticated and quite mature companies that they're not necessarily aware of some of these tools and how they're being used so i intentionally try and kind of bring up people's major instant tool stack every time because it's an opportunity just for people to go oh, okay great Let, let's have a look and there are things that can really help my major instant managers um, and the companies in this space are working really hard to refine um 
the tools for the major incident community and they're all quite excited to get to engage with the community so we, we did the did you see the the virtual expo we did last year yeah i did what i watched a bit of it i missed the actual okay event yeah i mean I it was it, it later on yeah it was it was it was it was the first one we'd ever done so i mean there were a good couple of thousand people yeah um, but it's quite exciting. It'll be later towards the end of the year, just with everything that's ha- that's happened. Um, but we're really excited for for this year's because it's going to be so much bigger. And we got pretty massive attendance last year. But it's more the content and people feeling that they can speak. There was a real um, nervousness. Loads of people wanted to talk about situations that they thought would help others and their knowledge. But I think there was a nervousness around being able to talk about your company just because no one was doing it. Um, so they felt like you couldn't. And now you're seeing lots of companies act- actively encouraging it and, and really wanting the community. And so this year, there's there's already some pretty incredible people who are going to speak and, and quite excited. And and hopefully you'll have a conversation with your company and you'll also be one of the speakers um, at this year's. Because I think there's, particularly with your military background, I think there'd be an amazing talk in there somewhere for you to talk about the, the transition and the skills that you learn in the military and how that's applied to, to leading major incidents. But um, yeah, so, so sorry for the, I'm essentially trying to plug all the software companies just so people are aware when you know, I ask that question. And, and, um, and understandably, because automation is a key part of, of you know, uh, of the major instant tooling, you know, you just understanding, alerting, you know, monitoring, alerting, you know, I, I'm, we do use a lot of tools, Dynatrace, all of the good things. There's a lot of tools out there to be to use, and um, so you're right, absolutely. They they should not be, you know, we shouldn't miss them. If, you know, companies should know that there's a lot of tooling out there that can assist them in really reducing their MTTR by reaction yeah. rather than being reactionary. You'd be proaction, you know, you'd be proactive. So yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the one of the things that that really excites me is the essentially um, on call rotors and at the click of a button being able to engage multiple people um, via voice or text, like an automated um, voice or text. And if they don't answer, essentially escalating to the next person on call, so that you can essentially get a, a pretty much a one click bridge call and have everybody on it. And the major instant managers had minimal lifting. Um, whereas the old days you're running around trying to phone everyone um, and the time that can take just to get people on the call means your either initial comms or, or even your time to engage yeah. is just so slow um, so it's, it's one of the things that really excites me um, and I think we use that JP that kind of thing you know you've got a yeah. quick reaction team um, you know all lined up for certain specific incidents and it's a quick page to all of them and they're on the bridge yeah. so yeah definitely absolutely tooling is huge and it's well the, the cool. these these companies are incredible but but it's going to be on us in the industry to help shape them to make them exactly what we want as we're all evolving um which is why i mean i did a bit of a rant at last year's as well where i was kind of going on about these aren't suppliers you've got to see them as partners and I know we're all busy as major instant managers and we get called away, but actually you need to take the long-term attitude with them of going, well, actually we, this bit's not quite right or actually we want more of this function and kind of taking time out of your day to really give them uh, enough to keep improving. Um, and I think if enough of us keep doing this, we'll get to a point where in a year to two years, the community side of this just looks completely different. Um I mean, we're already taking big leaps, and people are doing great work. But um, but it'll be yeah, re- really exciting. So it's um, quite a, I mean, you know, you've been going for a couple of years now, but it's still new. There's still a lot of things being discussed that is, is sort of the concept of major incident, and, and now we're moving. I think you're maturing more, and you're bringing in all the other stuff that you know, because we don't need to talk about the important administrative pieces anymore. You know, everybody's already got that, so I, that's my impression. So yeah, we definitely. Definitely need to move forward, don't we? So what, um, JP Morgan, I appreciate it will be, be all over the place. What kind of volume are you dealing with on, on a daily basis? Is it quite a high volume? 
there's a lot of incidents go on at, uh, at JP Morgan Chase. A lot of incidents because that's it. Incidents, you know, from password resets, millions, you know, probably a lot more. And uh, but major incident. We're in a good space because, like I said, we've got good tooling. Um, and you know, so before things become really big, you know, they're addressed. Uh, so you know, no, I wouldn't say they're massive. Uh, you know. Probably have more incidents, manage more incidents uh, at um, at National Grid, but even they were, um, you know, because the the processes wouldn't really be classed as major incidents all the time. So, so you know, yeah. it's I haven't really noticed any massive up, upturn, even in you know with working from home. So, I've not seen a massive uptick in in, in major. Incidents. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, a, a lot of a lot of companies we work with have seen quite substantial uptakes, but I guess if you're if you were already in a space where you had quite a dynamic workforce, you wouldn't see as much. Yeah. I think the the companies who didn't um, and suddenly saw this immediate massive transformation. There's um, obviously a of, lot of, of people. a lot of remote access working issues to start with, because clearly. Going from no, hardly anybody working from home to having 30,000, 50,000, 70,000, 80,000, you know, exponentially yeah, growing. <laughs> yeah, the, there is a, you know, the, the, there is a lot of, of, of those sort of incidents. But, you know, the, the, the real big hit major incidents, they're, they're just, you know, it's, it's just what it is. It's, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't really say, like I said, that we've, We've, uh, would you say so? What would you say? Like one a day, two a day, ten a day? Major incidents that you're you're probably dealing with in your unit? There'll be a couple. Of, there'll be a couple of incidents a day. Um, yeah. You know that are, we're always working, but it's yeah. it's it, but a lot of major incidents are raised because of the potential of the impact. So yeah. so whilst I'm you know I, I say that we you know we've we haven't got a massive amount of major incidents. We are working all the time. You know, we're always on incidents yeah, because yeah. we are we're managing the the, the smaller potential, uh, you know, impacts that come in. So we're busy enough. I mean, that's so. That's another really important thing you've touched upon there. In that, I talk about this at least when I do the train. I know my trainers do about um, potential major incidents need to be handled still by the major incident team. Um, and and that's that proactive piece in that why why if we're here to serve our customers and end users would you possibly kick back a potential major incident because it's not yet a major incident I mean that's bureaucracy um, that's kind of gone out of control um, yeah I and so I talk about that quite a lot of of course we need to be dealing with those um, I appreciate sometimes there are capacity issues with staffing like if you're an under under resourced major incident function. Um, that can be quite difficult, and you you perhaps have to be a bit more and um, pick and choose. But for the sake of of, of hardline process, now I, I remember that being a thing, um, less so now. Um, but again, like earlier in my career, I remember that being nope, it's not a major incident yet. We're not interested. And you look back now and you go, wow, that's that's almost the exact opposite of a kind of customer first, service first mentality. Uh, but that re- really interesting. Thank you for sharing. So um, so let's let's um let's go on to people in your career so um who would you say um is the best major instant manager you've ever worked with um yourself excluded of course you're not allowed to <laughs> that's a real tough one honestly i i had the very good fortune of moving into the major instant function at national grid when um a year around a year or so later after they started bringing it in house, uh, and obviously from a company to go from, you know, external major instant management function to an internal major instant management function, you you really want it done right. Uh, and so, I had the for- good fortune of, of of working with some real long serving, very good major incident managers. You know that that. Um, taught me quite a lot I, mean, I don't know whether i should mention names but uh it might be embarrassing for them they might not thank me for it 
But there was. A, I, I, I imagine they will. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there was. I mean, I sort of when I moved, when you move into a new function, you always appreciate the person that's um, there to assist you. Yeah. And so I had, I had yeah. a real good, um, I had a really good sort of soft landing when I joined uh, the, the major instant function at a, a national grid because, like I said, we had an awful lot of um of very very qualified uh, major incident managers so i mean there was there was two guys there one one of them was um a guy called andy davis um he's, like i said he's probably not gonna thank me for saying this but he was somebody that I, every time I was on shift with him, because we did various shifts, yeah? But every time I was on shift with him, we would be, um, I would be listening to the way he handled calls, the way he managed people, you know, the way he managed the sort of the more senior managers. Um, so, so from from that perspective, from, from a learning perspective and from, you know, somebody to emulate, it was Andy. Andy Davis, but there was a guy called Mark Gibson who I moved into the actual role, and he I shadowed him, and but for his meticulous teachings and because everywhere you go there's a different way of doing things, yeah. So you know I've had to yeah. I've had to curtail the way I do things. I did things at National Grid that, that I do at J.P. Morgan Chase because that's the way it is. Whereas Mark taught give me them them skills. Um, so from a meticulous, you know, good cross cross the the uh, t's and dot the i's it was marked but but for an all round real you know sage sagacious type type person it was it's got to be Andy Davis. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Thanks. No, I'm sure they'll I'm sure they'll appreciate the the plug. I think that's again not a massively talked about components of how important like developing major instant skill set is is having like a really good either kind of mentor or coaching figure particularly when you land in a new new organization that does have slightly different working practices i think those people and having a good one of them just sets up everything for success whereas there being kind of a lack of that and this is part of um we're doing a lot with and um, we'll actually publish some of this soon but we're doing a lot with companies around um job tiers in major instant management so for example like a level one a level two a level three and the competencies and behaviors that need to be shown by that because it does a couple of things one it means um that you have uh, progression within the role because often people who are good major instant managers can be ambitious too so the worst thing you want to do really is is give them somewhere where they feel like there's no progression option or, or any way to develop having like multiple levels which increase going well actually this is what's expected is really useful for someone f feeling like they get to continually develop um, and they should as well I don't mean you should just pay lip service to it I mean that actually there should be competencies and a higher expectation of someone who is for example a level three um, and that does a lot in terms of keeping people who would be incredible coaches in that role so that you don't potentially lose them to a different part of the business too soon. Um, but I think pay scales is a really interesting one because, I mean, we did we did the annual report and it's really interesting. Banks, I think, are pretty good at understanding the and quantifying downtime. So they can, can be, in our experience, very good at understanding the cost of losing someone then having to hire again for that role so they they are a bit better at um investing in people in terms of money and training i think other areas are a bit slow to catch up managed service providers are getting good at this as well actually um, and they're doing more work around creating job tiers they're doing more work around training we're, we're doing a few global transformation with with a couple of the, the larger managed service providers um, and their leadership really get it but i think there is a there is a, an issue, and I call it creating sustainable major instant functions when I'm talking about actually your talent acquisition and retention strategy and saying, well, these are the things that must go into it if you really care about these people and want to retain the skills and knowledge that actually is quite rare in our world. Um, you need to kind of do the legwork to set it up for success. 
Um, and so I think people like them that you've mentioned, um, making sure that you retain them and look after them instead of losing all that talent and the, the tribal knowledge as well that you get from a company. I think it's just so important. And again, something that's often overlooked. It's always, it's always slightly blown my mind how um, to, to give people either nominal raises with inflation or whatever. Companies go, no, yet they'll then spend on recruiting somebody completely new to the function and potentially even then paying more as a salary. I've always found that absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but it definitely still goes on in our world, um, I think, which is which is an interesting. I one. think, from my perspective, for, from the major instant function, is there's such a disparity between pay, uh, and that's our problem. That really is, uh, you know. I we've, you know, we we people ask for major, you know, job job specs come up and they want a major instant manager and they're paying say 45 to 55 or whatever um and then you get other companies that are paying 50 to 70 um there's such a disparity between pay between major instant managers that people i don't know that people are not really sure about that what that that, that piece you know what you were saying there so i don't know it's, it's i don't know how i you, think that goes I don't know how you you solve that one but I'm sure you've got some ideas. Well, we're 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 gonna well yeah we have actually we're, we're gonna we're gonna publish the tiers and the structure that we think there should be within, and we're we're gonna give some indicative pricing for salaries, um for all the different countries and regions. But we'll start with the the ones that we work most in, um because we know those best and have the data on it, and we'll we'll give companies some some guidance on kind of if you want this level of experience and this level of, of seniority and, and skill, then this is roughly the the range that you should be expecting to pay. Um, and and we'll keep publishing annual reports on salaries to say, look, this is how they're moving as a global trend. This is how they're not. Um, I think that comes in, though. The companies that are paying, like, in in our world, in, in, in the pound sterling, like 70 to 80 grand or more, I think they're typically the ones who get it and they're looking for someone who's potentially like done ops director roles or, or just run major instance at that level of seniority and could face off with like the CEO, for example, of, of a country if it was that much of a problem. Um, and they expect blood though. They know it's very hard work. Um, you, you're going to work for that. Whereas there are some companies who are yeah paying m much lower it depends what region they're in because it's all relative and cost of living is different in other places um yeah mine was just uk i think it's mine was just obviously something yeah. uk yeah yeah no it's it's, it's really interesting though because naturally like in the whole of the it world because it budgets are being squeezed by businesses just because businesses need to continually create cost efficiencies you saw um offshoring to india was a massive trend for many years and and so just part of that that continues. I think culturally there was some misalignment sometimes. So I think actually then it moved across to places like Europe. Um, I mean Poland, for example, you've got um, a relatively low cost of living, but you've got a really well educated group of people. So their standard education level is quite high. Um, a really intelligent bunch of people who are eager to. Um, do really good work and that's why you've seen lots of companies going to Poland in the technology space I mean I could just list all of them have gone there and I think it's a really good move but naturally what starts to come with that over the years of maturity is the cost of, of that labor there goes up and so then everyone all the companies look um, for the next place where you're going to get that balance of really skilled people but the cost isn't so high and they have it's, it's a weird it's a bit of a dichotomy because i mean we're talking kind of global strategy here so we're slightly off piste but it, it's an interesting challenge because they have no choice if you're either in-house it or you're the cio or you're a managed service provider if your clients or end users or the business is saying sorry this is now your budget but we need more um, you have very little option but to continually look for economies of scale and, and new areas where cost of labour is, is lower. And I'm sure that's the way it is with pretty much every industry. Um, I think it's just hard in our industry because there is such complexity to what we do. In you need these really smart people. 
um, and really smart people typically over a period um, expect to be paid as such. Um, but I think what's interesting is I often hear um, people who are perhaps working at, at much lower ends of the scale in terms of salary and they'll do some work with us and training with us. And it's going back to what I was saying. They, they believe that they're kind of here and what they're delivering is here. But if you were to look at them on a maturity assessment, kind of they don't really have any understanding of, of leadership. They've never had exposure to it. It doesn't mean they're not naturally talented in some way. You get some people who've got incredible innate leadership skills. And they're, they're doing what you and I perhaps would consider very basic major instant management, and they've never really had to deal with some of the pressures that you were talking about. And they see a job going for £70,000 or £80,000, and they're slightly disgruntled. They think that's what they're doing, and so they don't understand why they're not earning that. And so with respect, I, I try and kind of educate them and go, no, 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 it's completely different from what you're doing, the level of pressure, and also the, the severity of mistakes um, that can be made potentially can be career ending when you're earning um, like an executive particularly in the UK um, you, you take the responsibility that comes along with that um, and so it's a really different thing which I think has confused everyone as you say there's someone who's maybe earning like I don't know 30,000 or, or whatever um, and they're looking at this 70 or 80,000 pound job and they're like yeah but I do this why aren't I earning that and it's yeah but hopefully again the community will 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 spend more time engaging with one another so that people get that. But hopefully the tiers that we're talking about and, and what we'll publish will help both people's understanding of that, but also help give employers a bit more of a guideline around where it should be. I mean, I'm biased, but I personally think that really good major instant managers should be paid a lot more. <laughs> but I would say that because I originally was one um, and I see the work they do and actually ha how much. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them yeah. are though, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> most of them are though yeah. if you look at i mean if you look at most of the world and this is why what i was sort of getting at excuse me for no no please do please. I think this is quite an important point because what because a lot of major instant managers in my experience over the last you know 10 years or whatever has have been contractors because the actual function itself has always been a a temporary function yeah and and it's only lately that people are now starting to really understand the benefits of in-house major incident. Yeah. Over the last five years, I've sort of seen that sort of trend go. So most of the uh, major incident managers are were contractors on a lot of money yeah. because contractors, you know, they don't they're not permanent. They don't get holidays. They don't get all of the benefits that you know you go to a big company and you get all. The, the decent packages so they're yeah, on a and the risk wage. of the risk of being out yeah. of work for six months and yeah yeah there's yeah, it's, it's exactly. not as rosy as everyone so, thinks <laughs> there are so i have so, so so from my perspective I, i've always thought major instant managers have been paid well you know uh because i you know i've seen the, the contractors you know, i've not been tempted to do the contracting piece myself well i have been tempted but it's not panned out that way but um yeah, you know, I think that the the role itself is definitely good, and I think you should get paid ex more money than than normal in IT because you're dealing with all them pressures every day. Yeah. That you, that a lot of people get them pressures in IT. Don't get me wrong, I'm not I'm not saying that they they don't, but being on a major incident management call to to restore a service to the BAU is is a lot more stressful than, than a lot of people think. Yeah, particularly you know? particularly if you're working at a bank. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but in, fa in fairness, from at least from the last survey um, analysis we did, banks were, were some of the better ones to pay. But then again, this is why this tier is so important. People just need to understand, like, if, yeah. if you are going to earn the good money that is available, you do need to be operating at this level up here and you can't mistake what you're currently doing. Um, for for what is being asked of you up here, um, yeah. so yeah, it's it that has been. I I'd agree actually. Yeah, you you did see a lot of contractors there, and I think it is. I it, for me, it all comes down to people really quantifying the cost of major instance because suddenly the the investing in in permanent staff, the investing in command centres, yeah, and again, the banks are pretty good in particular for this. But I think it changes the whole narrative, um, but. I think because people are unsure of how to really quantify downtime a lot of time, which is not that difficult. You can get pretty good 
estimates in there just from working with the right people in the business units um it just means you have to ask some uncomfortable questions that the people don't necessarily want to answer um a lot of the time but um listen thank you so much for your time um really really appreciate it really enjoyed talking to you um it, it's i tend to really speaking to people who are this passionate about major incident management really enjoy it um and so if um if anyone wants to speak to you or reach out to you or just have conversations about major incident management um are you on any of the the social media platforms are you i know you're on linkedin yeah i'm on linkedin okay yeah I'm, yeah i'm sure there'll be other major instant managers who'd love to pick your brains and, and and talk to you so great um so before we go are, are there any questions that i haven't asked you that you think i probably should have and would be interesting for people no, you put me on the spot. I now. have. I think one of the one of the questions I think is quite key is where do I see uh, the future of major uh, you know the major instant management community. Um, they, oh, I think I, think I sent that, that to you, and I've completely missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did, and, and I haven't prepared anything because it was just something. You know, and I, I, so obviously you sent me some questions, and I did a bit of you know just to make sure I didn't look stupid. When <laughs> no, I was far answering. from it. Far from um, it. <laughs> but that one is key. Where, where, what is the future of major instant, uh, the major instant management community? And I think it, it's what you're doing. I think we are, like I said, we were, from my, this is my opinion. So, you know, um, nobody else can hold me to it. Uh, it's in the past, it was, it was the major instant function was more um, contract, it was more temporary it wasn't a real big you know a lot of a lot of firms from this is my perspective for a lot of firms obviously had major incidents in-house but so it was all it was always this little black art thing it was never anything that there was any hard and fast rules to and i, and I think the, the future of major incidents is we need c continuity across all the businesses we need to have a set of guidelines and a set of of, of performance indicators uh, and I think you're moving that way because you alluded to the fact that you're doing tier work. And that's yeah. really important because you can't have someone fresh just go straight into a, you know, a P1 incident uh, because they just wouldn't be able to manage it from the, the scope of it because um, they're quite difficult. So it, it's good for that. And like I said, the continuity across all businesses for me personally is is, is sharing best practices. Yeah. Um, and formalizing them because like i said i was process driven earlier uh, and i think that's where i see the future of major incident management uh, moving to and i believe more companies i believe uh, just looking at the trend in i believe more companies will need the the, the sort of the tiering information the the you know what the idea of what you should pay what you sh what what level people should be at and that will allow businesses to to really buy into the major instrument function yeah so, it's been no brilliant thank you thank you i hope um one of the things i really hope is that people who perhaps aren't doing this as a role and you're right i mean we've obviously we've got the global best practice in it major instrument and that that's a whole part of our framework and the training we deliver as well as all the leadership skills continue improvement and that the the uptake in just a number of short years from from major companies is incredible and, and how they're investing in people is really commendable because they typically didn't have to budget for these um these kinds of frameworks or training they might have done the generic of, of training people in ITIL which is extremely useful and I'll definitely say it's very valuable to people but it wasn't specific to major instant management so I think seeing I mean we've got customers in 76 countries now it's probably a bit more than that um, on a mixture of like physical training and e-learning that we do and and so it's been really humbling to see the whole industry shift off the back of the work we've done and, and see this and one of the biggest things is people having a common language when they look at the framework and they go, okay, when we're now talking about a complex issue, I completely get what stage of, of major incident management you're talking about and what, what's expected within that. But the the piece that I, you're absolutely right that we need to work on and, and, and try and help drive is now that the tiering and understanding right, what's a level one, what's a level two, and also helping support lots of people to start looking at it as a 
career path because I think you you used to find people would because there, it didn't seem like there was anywhere to go from it and because some companies weren't focusing on the leadership skills you didn't think actually um, whether it's one or, or five or ten years or whatever or you decide that you just love major instant management and you want to do that over the long term I don't think as many people looked at it as a career move they thought well okay I need to how am I going to progress to I don't know a service delivery manager used to be for for a, a more junior major instant manager or how do I move into problem management or and so they saw it as a stepping stone whereas actually because of the type of role it is, you want deep, deep expertise and you want people who have done it for many, many years in the same way that you would want an executive leader like a CTO or a CIO. You'd want someone who just has that knowledge over many, many years. You want that for major instant management, but it means that you've got to create the conditions. And I think you're 100% right. We've got to really support companies in getting that right. And and. I mean, there's so many smart people in our industry. The work we do off the back of that, people will run with it and evolve that many times over. Um, but it's exciting, really exciting time for us um, in, in the industry. Yep. Really exciting. If we, particularly if we get more people looking at this as a career, it means the selection pool for companies is far greater and, and therefore you get the very best, which means customers get better service, people retain contracts, um, happier technical resolving groups, happier service managers. But, but So look, Jason, I've taken up more than enough of your time. Really, really appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Absolutely. The same back to you, Adam. It's been a good, nice getting your views on it as well. It wasn't just a one way. It was, you know, it's good to hear your your input as well. So. That's, that's partly because I can't help myself. I talk a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>